Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, and it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, we've got quite a few new folks that have never been here before, and so those of you out in television, you look over the audience, and you're going to see a few new new faces this afternoon. And uh, for all the rest of you who come in... Uh, we always like to let it be known once in a while anyway that we've still got the book, Question and Answers, and uh, I don't like to peddle them, but uh, on the other hand, we want to make people aware that they are still available. And uh, again, I always have to thank my audience, all of you here and those of you on television for your prayer support, for your letters, your comments. My, what an encouragement it is to know that the Lord is using us to open the Scriptures to so many. And uh, we thank you for your financial help. After all, television is not free. And uh, we do thank you for all of that. All right. Now, for those of you in the audience here in the studio, you can see on the board that we're going to start with the mysteries that are scattered throughout Paul's epistles. And uh, I have the studio on his turn to Ephesians 1 verse 9, but I just happen to think I better go back (laughs) to Deuteronomy once again for the sake of new listeners. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Most of you regular listeners, you know this by memory just from rote repetition, but uh, it's one of the most descriptive verses for understanding what Paul calls the mysteries that were revealed to him and him alone. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I always have to give credit for finding this verse to a dear gentleman who was in one of my Oklahoma classes. He was not only a retired Army general, but he was a retired college president. And he came up one night and he said, Les, I found a verse that just fits the way you teach. And I said, what is it? Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I had never seen it before. Really, I had never seen it before. And now, of course, I use it hundreds and hundreds of times because it just says it all. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Now stop and think a minute. What does that mean? Well, exactly what it says. God is sovereign. God is in total control, and He can do whatever He wants, however He wants, whenever He wants. Now, that's what it means. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. He can keep things secret if He wants to. But, see, the flip side. Those things which are revealed and are no longer secret, they belong to us, and of course, Moses is writing, so he's speaking of the children of Israel. But nevertheless, it's still appropriate for us to understand, coming back now with me to Paul's epistles in Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 9. And uh, we're going to be looking at mysteries all afternoon. And the first thing I have to qualify is that the word mystery is also the same identical word for a secret. That's why I took you to Deuteronomy 29, 29. All right, so now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, we have an instance, not the only one, not even the first as far as that goes. But in Ephesians 1, verse 9, he says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the secret of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, see, I've already explained that with my opening remarks. Why is it according to his good pleasure? He's sovereign. And he can keep things secret until he's ready to reveal it. All right, now, here is one of the revealed secrets, then, that you'll find only in the letters and the epistles of Paul. And it's referred to here as the mystery of his will. Now, if you just read that casually, you just don't think anything of it. But hopefully, I'm getting people to understand that you've got to stop and analyze these things without just running by them. So what in the world is he talking about that God's will has been kept secret? Now, maybe I better qualify that. Uh, I'll make it easy for you. Just turn over in this same book of Ephesians. There's another one in Romans 16, but let's use the one in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 9, we'll be coming to it probably later this afternoon. If we don't get there today, we'll get here at our next taping. 
But here is exactly what we have to understand. That these things that Paul reveals, uh, refers to as the mysteries were doctrines and tenets of our faith that were never known anywhere else in Scripture. See, and this is what makes Paul's apostleship so set apart from all the rest of our Bible, is that all these things were kept secret until revealed to this apostle. See, and that's what most of Christendom can't understand. And of course, the first reason they can't understand it, they won't read Paul. In fact, I don't know if I mentioned it in my last taper or not, but one of my listeners, I won't even name the state, but in one of the far-off states, sent me a clipping from her newspaper. And across the top of the newspaper, she wrote less. Now I understand what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. And then she had underlined one of the letters to the editor. And it was in response to a letter that a pastor in their community had written, being critical of... Well, now this letter that she had outlined for me to read, I've got it in my Bible here, but I won't take time to read it. But you cannot imagine the venom that can spew out of people's mouths when they start attacking the Apostle Paul. And that's what she was doing, just with venom, no Christian love whatsoever. And she just ridiculed the man, how he was kicked out of Greece, he was kicked out of Turkey, and he was stupid, and he was this, see? Well, she's not alone. Now, she might be on the, what shall I call it, on the worst end of it, but that's multitudes of people today. They got no time for this apostle. And at most, they'll just use a verse here and there. But to understand his mysteries, they don't want any part of it. All right, you got Ephesians 3, verse 9, and I'll get back to the one I intend to start with. Verse 9, he says, And I want to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, when he speaks of the mystery, I'm going to put it this way. Now he's speaking of this whole body of truth. That all of these things that were revealed to this apostle, not counting eight, that's back in the book of Revelation too, but all these first seven mysteries are, are basic doctrines that you will not find anywhere else in Scripture. You just can't find it. No use even wasting your time to look. All right, so back to my verse in Ephesians. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, or this huge compilation of secrets, which from the beginning of the world, now that takes us at least back to Adam, that have been hid from the beginning of the world, have been hid where? In God. That's why he could keep it secret. It was within his makeup, see? All right, all these things have been hid in God. The same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, so that's the whole concept then that I want to have you see this afternoon is that all these Pauline doctrines that he calls the mystery had never been revealed before. You can't find them in the four Gospels. You can't find them in the Old Testament. You can't find them in the little epistles at the end. They are uniquely within the epistles of this apostle. All right, so now then let's come back to our number one on the board, Ephesians 1.9. Having made known unto us the mystery or the secret of his will. Now I'm going to stop right there. Now, goodness sakes, we all know that beginning with the human experience, back with Adam and Eve, God's will was certainly exercised and made known, wasn't it? In other words, so far as Adam and Eve were concerned in the garden, what was God's will concerning what they could or could not do? Well, everything in the garden is for you to enjoy except that tree. So the will of God was expressed. And so when he dealt with Moses and he dealt with some of the other patriarchs and David and the prophets, we know that God expressed his will. So now what's the point I'm trying to make? Yet when it comes to you and I as a member of the body of Christ, understanding the will of God is something so totally different and superior to anything that ever went before. 
See, and that's what the average believer does not comprehend, that we are in such a unique position in God's dealing with the whole human race that as members of the body of Christ, we have an understanding of the will of God that even Adam didn't have. We have an understanding that Moses didn't have. We have an understanding that Abraham and the rest of them didn't have. All right, well, let's just see what the Scripture says about it. Uh, continue on in Ephesians chapter 1 to see what I'm driving at. Jump across, at least in mine, to the other page. Go over to verse 15. And see if we can just get a little better comprehension of what Paul is talking about. This whole secret of a revealed will of God to you and I as believers today compared to the rest of biblical history. All right, verse 15. Now, this is a prayer of the apostle on behalf of the Ephesian believers. He says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, here is the apostle's prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Let me repeat. And you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? See, not the rest of the world. They know nothing of these things. But this is imparted only to you and I now as what we call grace age believers. See? All right, now let's just flip over a few pages to Colossians, and we have much the same thing, but to a different group of Gentiles over in Colossae. Now come into Colossians chapter 1. And again, we're going to look at a prayer of the Apostle on behalf of this congregation. And so we can just take the two of them together, and they're for us. Absolutely they are. Verse 9, Colossians chapter 1. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that is, of their professing faith in this preaching of the cross, that since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with, now here it comes, the knowledge of his what? His will, see? That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Well, for whom? Well, for us, for you and every individual believer. God has a will for that particular life, see? And this is what the apostle is praying. That to desire you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual, what's the next word? Understanding. How many church people have that today? Not many. And I'm not being judgmental, I'm just taking the general attitude of people. I hear it all the time. They invite them to a Bible study, not interested. They're not the least bit interested in finding out a little more about what this book says. Why not? They're not in the will of God, because God's will is that we grow in knowledge of His Word. And when you grow in the knowledge of His Word, you're going to experience, like I had a lady call from, I guess I can name the state, she called from Maryland. And she said, Les, yesterday I had the most exciting day of my whole life. I will tell me about it. She said, I'd been to the mall and I'd finished shopping and I was on my way out to the car and she said, here as I went by one of these little outside cafes, you know, you see them in every mall. There this young man was sitting by one of those tables reading intently and she said, I walked over, got close enough and I noticed he was reading the Bible. And so she says, I stopped and noticed that he was in Proverbs and he had everything all highlighted and underlined. So she said, I was brazen enough. I said, young man, are you reading Proverbs? And he says, yes. She says, why? Well, he says, it's the only book in this whole Bible that agrees with Plato. <laughs> she said, Plato? 
who's that? <laughs> and he said, well, he lived 300 B.C. What's that got to do with you? Well, he says, according to Proverbs, he said a lot of the things fit. She said, can I just sit down and share the scriptures with you? And he said, yes, please do. Oh, he's just a young guy, about 30. So as I sat down, and she said, now, unless you talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, of course, she said, I've been listening to the program every morning in Romans. And so she said, all that was fresh on my mind. But as I took his Bible, and she said, I went from verse to verse to verse, and she said, it was just the most exciting thing I've ever had happen. And she said, the guy was attentive. He was taking it all in. And she said, I was hoping that I could share phone numbers with him, but that he wouldn't do. But said, when I got ready to leave, he did say this. He said, lady, you are the first person I've ever met that can make sense out of this book. Well, wouldn't you go back to your car on cloud nine? Yes, you would. And so this is what we have to wait for. When you get that out of it, don't think, well, I don't think I'm... Yes, the Spirit will take over. I had another lady some time ago in one of my classes in Oklahoma came in one evening on cloud nine. She had just shared the scriptures with a couple of three teenagers. And she said, every verse that came to mind, I could find it. And I said, that's the way the Spirit works. All right, so this is what it means to be under the control of the will of God because that will in its turn bring in wisdom and spiritual understanding. All right, now to qualify you as a believer to have this kind of understanding, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm hoping that I can make all these things come together and realize that you and I as believers have a relationship with God and an understanding of His Word that Israel never had, not even the best of them, not even the prophets, because, see, they didn't have this special revelation that we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 10. We're just going to do a lot of Scripture reading today, because after all, it's the Word of God that's powerful, not what Les Feldick says. The Word of God is powerful. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Not just the fluff. See, that's where most of Christendom is. They're up there just scratching the surface. But the Spirit wants us to get down into the deep things. Now verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of men, save or except the spirit of man whatever but there's still nothing more than the things of men see all right now then on the same basis then even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god in other words if you're going to send a young man to medical school you don't expect some accountant to teach him anatomy do you what do you expect? Well, you want somebody who is skilled in the discipline of anatomy to teach your kid the part of medical school that that applies to. Well, it's the same way with Scripture, see? You don't go to the outside world to understand Scripture. We go to that blessed Holy Spirit, which, as he says in verse 12, is freely given, see? All right, now verse 12. Now we have received get into the book. So we haven't got the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's not something you have to work and strive for. Just ask God to pour it out, and he will. And now verse 13. Which things, these things that come from God himself by way of the Holy Spirit, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, does that tell you something? Why do I use scripture verse after scripture verse after scripture, comparing spiritual with spiritual? Line upon line. That's the only way to do it, see? All right, now then, verse 14. This is really the verse I was heading for. But... The natural man, the unsaved person, the unsaved person receives not 
the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. He's got no time for these things. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. That's why they're foolishness. He can't understand it anyway. And they are spiritually discerned. Now that's what it means then to know the will of God, is to understand that only by the working of that indwelling Holy Spirit can we come to a knowledge of these spiritual truths. All right, now then, let's see, where do I have you, 1 Corinthians? Come back a little further now to Romans. Come back to Romans chapter 8. And that's been on the air now, not too long ago, so this should almost just be a, 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 like a little quick review. And you remember that when I was teaching Romans, I emphasized that in the first seven chapters there was almost no mention of the Holy Spirit? Almost none. But all of a sudden you break into chapter 8 and it just explodes. And I don't remember how many times, but I think it's something like 19, 20 times. In this one chapter we have reference to the Holy Spirit, and here it comes. Dropping down to verse 5, and this is all because of the revealed will of God in our lives, which was kept secret until it was given to this apostle. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but, now here it comes, they who are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life, that's eternal life, and peace, peace with God. And here's the reason. Because the carnal, the unsaved mind, is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, so they then that are in the flesh cannot please God. But, see, here we come. We're not in the flesh. We're in the Spirit. We're a whole new person as a result of our faith in that preaching of the cross, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, so we're not in the flesh, we're in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, no matter how many times he's walked the aisle, no matter how many times he's been baptized one way or another, if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, he's still as lost as a goose, is my favorite expression. He doesn't know where he's going. But if you have the Spirit of God, then that is God's mark that you are indeed a child of his, which we're going to see in the next minute or so. All right. Verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, in other words, the very Spirit of the God of creation, the God who consummated the work of the cross, raised Christ from the dead, if the Spirit of that God dwells in you, and then he will quicken your mortal bodies by that Spirit that dwelleth in you. All right, now then, I'm going to bring you all down to verse 14. That when we experience true salvation, you have truly trusted and believed the gospel plus nothing. That the work of the cross was complete. I just emphasized again last night with a caller. I said, listen, when Jesus said it's finished, was he kidding? He was dead serious. And he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. The work of salvation was finished. He did it all. Now, of course, we've got to jump ahead three days and include the resurrection. But nevertheless, what has mankind done ever since the Apostle Paul was given this revelation? Throwing everything at it but the kitchen sink. My, they're adding baptism, they're adding church membership, and they add tongues, and they add tithing, and they add healing, and they add this and that. Then what does that mean? That Christ didn't finish it, and you've got to add something to it? Isn't it ridiculous? But see, this is what I mean when I say that when you can place your faith and your trust totally in that finished work of the cross, nothing else is necessary. And then the Christian life follows. Of course it does. I'm, I'm not saying anything about that. But I'm talking about the means of salvation. So if we have trusted that gospel of the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, now then verse 14 kicks in, and this is where we are. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, they are the sons or the children or the born ones, I think comes out of the Greek, of God. For, he says in verse 15, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't shake in our boots before a holy and awesome God, do we? I hope not. My goodness, we're in a relationship with him. We're his. He's ours, see? All right? So you haven't received the spirit of bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, which means you've been placed as a full son. Not a babe, but a full son. Now again, I always have to emphasize, we start on two levels as a believer, don't we? The moment we're saved, yes, we're a babe in Christ. But on the other hand, we are placed in the body of Christ as a full heir. Read next verse. So the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are. Oh, I love that. Not something that you hope to be. Not something that you're going to try to be. You know, that's most of Christendom. Well, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying. I'm working at it. That won't do you nickels worth of good because that's not what God is looking for. He's looking for faith and trust in what he has done. See? All right. So if that's what we have done, then the Spirit and will be for all eternity. We are the children of God. But hey, it gets better. We're not just children. We're what? Heirs of God. And we're not just heirs. We're what? Joint heirs. How much closer can you get? And we're joint heirs with Christ. And that means that everything that's His is ours. But... It may also bring us to the place where we have to suffer with him. Now, fortunately, America so far hasn't had to do it. We may, but we know that down through the years, a lot of believers did. They suffered. They died as martyrs for their faith. But it's not a prerequisite, but it certainly is a distinct possibility that when we take a stand for Christ, we may yet have to suffer for it. Watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1 800 369 7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.